You want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. I'm Siwa Bealey Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV, so welcome to the show. This evening we have with us an author, and her name is Dr. Robin Ledoux. Correct. Ledoux. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Now you, you just came out with a book called Totems of September, and it is a novel of loss, healing, and redemption. So before we learn a little bit about the book, tell us about your tribe and yourself. Well, my tribe is the Cowlitz tribe. That's actually our nation. And we used to be very large, 22,000 back in 1855, the time of the Stevens Treaties. And there's two bands, um, the Cowlitz Nation, the Dinapum Band, which is what I'm from, Upper Cowlitz, and then the Lower Cowlitz, Kaluski. And the government said, since we live on the Cowlitz River, therefore we all must be Cowlitz, even though, of course, we weren't. And our tribe was a landless tribe for many, many years until February 14th, 2000. We finally got our recognition back. We had preliminary recognition in 1997. And the first claim went in in uh, 1916, so it was a very long battle oh, for us so. to get our recognition. Very long, and um, we now are not quite 4,000 people. We're still pretty scattered, um, but we finally got our recognition. I, w I always find that so interesting that the government finally recognized us and we as our people always recognized ourselves it's not you know Absolutely. we're not stranger to ourselves uh -huh. so i always find that term somewhat interesting that, that we're now recognized now the the where is the tribe located is that in washington or in the state of washington it's in the state of washington um the land came claim that we filed you know a century ago was uh for the 1.6 million acres that we refused to sell for a dollar and so our land came that was settled in 1973 was for a dollar an acre and our uh, aboriginal lands went from what would be lewis county in southwest washington down to the columbia and then all the way east um over what you would call mount st helens we call lowly Lok looks or she who smokes all the way over to mount um, adams so it was a huge territory of the two people all down the cowlitz river from Cloud's Glacier on Mount Rainier, Mount Tahoma, all the way down to the Columbia. So it's a very large territory. All so in you've had many books, you tell me. Yes. And so you've written many books, and a lot of it is based on your family, you said. Um, your family is from Washington? Yes. And they went to boarding schools there. Tell me about that. Well, actually, most of my writing, while it's written from a Native perspective, has been on historical trauma. In native communities. Mm -hmm. um, I have a series of children's book which actually Floyd Westerman who's in your opening was actually the narrator on our videos. Mm -hmm. This book actually um, it, I think it's more autobiographical but it does tell the story of a Lakota man and a Kiowa man who were actually forced into the boarding schools and that's how they met and had a lifelong friendship mm -hmm. from their survival together in the boarding school in Genoa in Nebraska. So this one's actually more autobiographical but it um, really tells the history of the Native people, of our loss of our culture, and how there's a redemption coming back now, and that's part of the redemption, mm -hmm. of our regaining of our culture. And my own family is certainly, that's true, my grandfather and great uncles were forced into the Cushman boarding school. Their hair was cut, um, their language was forbidden, and then my father was the next generation, the generation of shame where you didn't talk about being Native. And that's talked about in the book of how what we as Native people have gone through to even try and survive. And you mentioned to me earlier about your, your father was a fisherman? Was, or give me some of that history. Well, my father um, had six children, mm -hmm. 
and was a teacher, which is hard to raise six children on a teacher salary. So during the summer, he would go salmon fishing. Okay. And for those of us who grew up in the Northwest and in other places, we know the story of the Bolt decision, which was about reaffirming the treaty rights. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s and up into 70s, we had what were called the fishing wars in Washington, where the tribes, led by a wonderful elder we just lost, Billy Frank, um, would have fishings where they'd actually go out to their, like to Commencement Bay and their aboriginal fishing areas and fish, and they were arrested by federal agents, and there were also people killed. And I remember when I was 10, this was in 1964, my father um, and I and my Auntie Lucille and my Auntie Betty, who now passed, went to meet Billy Frank. And my father said, you're going to meet the bravest Native man you're ever going to meet. And that's when I met Billy Frank. And I said, why is he so brave, Daddy? Because he's a true warrior. He puts himself ahead of people. And Mr. Frank was arrested dozens and dozens of times and put in jail for fishing. And I can remember when my father came home and told me about what had happened that summer in Commencement Bay about the fish-ins and people being arrested, um, being terrified when my dad went out to fish that he was going to be arrested too and would be taken away from his children. Mm -hmm. And that impact, I was profound, I didn't realize how profound it was till I went to cover Mr. Frank's uh, last public presentation about a month ago at one of the tribal summits and heard him talk again uh, 50 years after the first time and then we lost him two weeks after that. So um, just growing up in the culture of the boarding schools and the fishing wars and understanding um, the racism that really still exists against Native people has had a profound impact on the work I did in my later life. And tell me a little bit about the tribe as far as, is it still primarily located in one area, is it has it spread out? Is it, is, has the language been retained, um, the culture, or has that um, been, you know, pretty much taken away from the government, et cetera? Well, we were a landless tribe mm -hmm. because we refused to sign the treaties in 1855. But there's always been a core group of Calitz people who have fought very, very hard for our rights, and around that core. I mean, there's been some spreading out, of course, because when you don't have a land base. Um, mm -hmm. But through the work of our leaders and now our recognition, there has been a, a real return to a sense of who we are as Cowlitz people. Mm -hmm. In, I think it was 1994, the tribe bought back, which I thought was interesting, we had to buy back 13.5 acres, <laughs> which is like, out of 1.6 million, it's not, you know, a huge. Yeah. But on that land, a uh, lodge was built. Okay. And from that, we're really trying to regain, you know, the, the traditions. The language, um, it's not completely gone and, and people are working to bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, we're part of the, the, the Cowlitz, not the Tidham people, are part of the Salish language group and there really is an effort to bring that back and to bring back traditions. Um, I was very blessed when my Auntie Lucille was still alive to actually um, be given a naming ceremony, the first one in, my, in the Ledoux family since about 1837. Really? Yeah. And so that was huge for my family to actually have a giveaway and to actually come together and celebrate someone. So you actually. were given your name? I, I was Which given my what? name. Uh, well, in our language, it's Tek Tuk Alash Lede, and it means owl woman. Means? Owl woman. Owl, owl woman. Yeah. Um, and there was a huge process that I had to go through. I, I, I don't know if you have this in California, but we have um, <laughs> what we call culture vultures in the state of Washington. And a very small town where I live, near, near, near Ellensburg, there's a woman, I, I won't get into her name right now, who um, has shamanic teachings. And it's how you can find your name in a 90-minute <laughs> session for only $15. It's like, oh. And I was like, gee, I went through two years just to get my aunt's approval and, and all this. So in my tribe, there really is a very concentrated effort to bring back the traditions. We have our first salmon ceremonies, and we have our powwows. And, we have a cultural um, department within the tribe now that's working very hard to bring back our traditions and get our baskets back and get our, hand, our hats back and stuff like that. So it's been very oh, concentrated. That's good. Yeah. that's good. Okay, so tell me a little bit about um, your background now. You've written children's books, you said? And I have, yeah. And made videos. Tell me about all that. Well, for 40 years I worked as a therapist and then got my 
doctorate in psychology, clinical psychology at Washington State and then worked as a private practice as a psychologist. But I was at the University of Washington Medical School for about 25 years in the fetal alcohol and drug unit and part of, a big part of what I did, um, and that's almost 30 years ago now, but coming forward, was research in Native communities on the prevention of fetal alcohol syndrome and looking at Native traditions as a way of keeping people sober mm -hmm. to address historical trauma, which I, I think people still want to ignore. It's just huge in Native communities. And so I went in as a psychologist to help identify the children and look at the families and look at what kind of supports would be needed to get families sober and to stop the cycle of fetal alcohol syndrome. And I did that for 25 years. And as part of that, uh, back in the late 1990s, uh, I wrote a series of books that were put together called Journey Through the Healing Circle. And there are four books, um, all written from the Native American animal storytelling tradition. Mm -hmm. The first one is um, Little Fox, and that's Birth to Five for FAS. The second one is, I better get them right, um, Best Day Ever and Little Mask, and that's about two raccoons who have FAS. And the third one is Sees No Danger and Wanders Afar, and that's about two bears who uh, wanders afar as a polar bear who gets on an airplane and ends up in Washington, and he meets a brown <laughs> bear, and they um, get into all kinds of legal trouble, and one of them ends up with an ankle bracelet, and they're on probation, oh <laughs> and they have to go in front of Bison, who's the magistrate, you know, and then one of the animals is a probation officer. And <laughs> so it's about what adolescents go through mm -hmm. that have fetal alcohol syndrome. And then the last one in the series is uh, Travels in Circles, and he's my favorite. And he's a little puffin who, his mom got FAS from drinking a bottle of champagne that washed up on a beach in Alaska. And um, he can't make it through school and he doesn't know how to groom himself, but he makes beautiful pebble pictures. Mm -hmm. And then one winter his parents die and he gets on an ice loan because he doesn't have a good attention span. He forgets what he's supposed to be doing and he ends up down at the fish market in Seattle and then Everybody goes to this healing circle in the center of the forest, which is modeled on the FAS clinic I worked for the University of Washington. And they meet Dr. Raven, who's very wise, and there's Al, the psychologist, and those were made into videos. And Floyd Westerman, a very dear friend of mine, was the narrator for the videos. And they were shown on PBS, and we were actually nominated for an Emmy. So, really? Well, yeah, so that, that was yeah, my series. It's called Journey Through the Healing Circle. But I wrote, um, manuals on FAS and I wrote articles over the years on um, healing historical trauma because for me that is the basis of what's going on in Indian country now. That if we don't heal the wounds of historical trauma we're going to have a really hard time finding our way forward. Do you travel lecturing? I used to. I haven't in many many years but I traveled all over the world and had an incredible opportunity to live and teach in Aotearoa in, in New Zealand and Australia many many years ago but I used to do a lot of traveling. What commonalities do you find in, since you've traveled all, you know, lower the different reservations, the different tribal experiences? In terms of? Of just day-to-day um, -day life, living. One of the things I think in working in many indigenous communities all, all around the world um, is a sense of spirituality that people, I don't think people really realize mm -hmm what we have. Deeply rooted. Deeply rooted mm -hmm. spirituality. And I, I was really impressed when I went to live with a, an amazing woman. She was from the Maniopoto people of the Tainui tribe. In, uh, I lived in Hamilton, New Zealand with her. Um, how similar their culture in Aotearoa, New Zealand was to our coastal Salish. Mm -hmm. Very, very similar. And, but again, it's so rooted in um, just a huge spirituality that, that has never been able to People cannot take that away from us. And we were talking today about um, this rapper Emerson Wendy who's wearing the headdress now. And one of the things I'm so happy to see now is Native people speaking up and saying, no, it's not okay to call us redskins. And no, it's not okay to wear our headdresses. And no, Heidi Klum, it's not okay to dress your models in little skimpy outfits. And, and for me, dress. yeah, to see that reclamation of, of our culture and our spirituality is just huge to see that coming back now. But that was the one thing that I would say no matter what community I went to, whether it was Alaska or Australia or anywhere, is that we still have that spirituality and that connection. I, I think that's so true. I think that's so true because 
for many, many years, you know, the language couldn't be spoken, the hair being mm -hmm. cut and everything, but that, that retaining the spirituality helped the tribes, all the different tribes, retain their culture. And it, 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 it was still embedded where mm -hmm. it could surface later, and that's what's happened. And you're right with, with um, I see on Facebook all the time, all these pictures of the, you know, the women <laughs> with the headdresses and of course the, you know, the mascotting and all of that. And that can't help the kids, you know, as far as um, the self-esteem and, you know, knowing themselves as native people. And I think to me, that's the whole issue is as people, and when we're not mascots, and um, Russell Means, who I had tremendous respect for, said, I'm, I'm not a mascot, I'm a man. And one of the things that, that I find really interesting is the backlash against Native people when we say, get rid of the name. And I swear, if one more person says to me, I'm honoring you by, <laughs> by calling you a redskin, say, do you know the history of the word about the scalping and the bounties and all that? I, I don't really feel honored, but you reminded me constantly of a really ugly part of history. And the, I don't know if you saw it recently with the University of, Nova uh, University of North Dakota students that had the, shoots, the shirts that said super drunk. Yes, and it I was, see that. I think it was S-I-O-U-X-P-E-R mm -hmm. with a, with a right, right. native chief and headdress with a bong. It's like, are you kidding me? And that people still feel that that's an okay thing to do really tells me how far we have to go. And I, that's some, such a mockery of who we are. But I want to go back to the commonality you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I saw over the 30 years that I traveled was a real determination of people in my generation and the next generation to speak up about who they are and to reclaim that spirituality. And you know, now I'm two generations removed from the boarding school, but it certainly impacted my family. And I sure. talk about how historical trauma is in our DNA. But, but in my own private practice and when I was traveling and looking at the issue of alcoholism, I always refer to it as spirit sickness, that our spirits mm -hmm. have been so wounded and that as we know that people who go through any type of post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol consumption is higher, drug consumption is higher, trauma is higher, and re-traumatization. And for me, Alkali Lake is a good example of get a community getting sober. And then some of the communities I worked with when I was up in the Quebec area and um, in the Canadian tribes, the First Nations tribes, seeing people really reclaiming their sobriety and healing that spirit sickness. And, and I think far more than the rest of the world realizes, and I don't know if you've ever had this statistic, but most people do not realize that over half of all Native people consume no alcohol whatsoever. None. Really? No, it's been researched and we never talk about that that in many, many communities, we have a lower alcohol consumption rate than other, other groups, and that never gets talked about. That's true. Never gets talked about. And in talking with the people who have been in recovery and who have abstinent families, and I come from an abstinent family, and my father was absolutely adamant there would be never any alcohol in our home. Again, it goes back to that spirituality and reclamation, but Phil May out of the University of New Mexico did a fabulous study and it looked at that 52% of all Native people consume zero alcohol. And we That's never talk good. about that. Yeah. That is an interesting fact and a good one, going in the right direction. Yeah. So what are your plans for yourself? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I retired about a year and a half ago uh -huh. and my life's taken a very interesting journey since then. Um, although I didn't need when I acquired a third horse. And my husband says you can only ride one at a time, but it's like, well, I'll find a way to do it. Take turns. Take turns, <laughs> yes. And interestingly enough, I've started writing poetry um, from a Native perspective, oh. which I, I shared earlier yes, with you. Yes, yes. On um, life in Indian country mm -hmm. and what that's like. And I'm working on my second novel. Well, tell us a little bit more about Totems of September. Well, that came about in a very interesting way. Um, in 2001, just before 9-11, mm -hmm. I took my auntie who, um, she had my younger aunt call and said, Lucille wants to go to Crazy Horse on the Mountain. So, you know, it's not a request, it's you will. And so I called my auntie and I said, auntie, I'm thinking of going to South Dakota for my birthday in September. I'm thinking of going to see Crazy Horse on the Mountain. What do you think? Shall we go? She goes, oh yeah, I want to go. 
<laughs> and I said, well, I'll fly us into Rapid City. And she said, no, she wanted to take the train. I said, Auntie, the train goes to Minot. That's in North Dakota. And she says, you have a driver's license. It's like, <laughs> OK, <laughs> that matters. That's settled. And so we drove to um, Crazy Horse, to Custer. Mm -hmm. And then part of our agreement was that I wanted to see Devil's Tower, um, Bear Lodge in Wyoming. H had always had a fascination. And so we went there. And um, I stayed at a beautiful ranch called the Diamond L Ranch in Hewlett. And then we drove back to uh, Minot. That was on September 10th. And then on September 11th, we were in the Minot train station and saw the second plane hit. Oh, you did? Yes, in oh real time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And um, we were allowed to board the train. And we boarded the train before the towers came down. And because the train was aluminum, the cell phones weren't working. So we were in essentially in this communication blackout for about 24 hours and didn't know anything about the towers falling until we got to Sp but Spokane. But you knew the first plane had hit. We knew, uh, we knew the first oh, two so had hit. Saw the we, saw, okay. we saw the second plane. And wow. so we were getting bits and pieces of information. And they were letting people off. But once we let mine out, they didn't have, people weren't coming on. So we had no information. And then we got to Spokane, and there it was. And um, when I got home that night, I found out that um, my brother Charles, who worked for Raytheon, um, knew four of the people on the American Airlines plane that went oh in my to the first tower. So it hit, it hit really close to my sure. family. And um, the next year, uh, I went back to the Diamond L and went back to Devil's Tower and was there on this incredible full moon night. And the parking lot was empty, and the, the asphalt was very warm. And I was laying on my back, looking up at this incredible full moon shining on this monolith. And I just couldn't get over the juxtaposition of how, in a matter of an hour, these huge towers that we had built as, as this great glory that was going to stand mm -hmm. forever had just come down in an hour. And here was this incredible monolith that had stood for 40 million years and was going to stand forever. I just couldn't get over that. Right. And I went home and um, started writing, just sat down one day and started writing. And then uh, a friend of mine said, will you write a chapter for me? And I said, sure, give me the name of the characters you wanted. And so I wrote that chapter. And then another friend said, well, will you write a chapter for me? And I said, sure, what characters you want? And then <laughs> wrote that chapter. And um, then my grandfather and great uncles came and talked to me in the shower which is, I don't know why you can't talk to me outside the shower. But, um, and 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd get up, and I'd just write. And then one day, it was done. And this oh is how the book came to be. So. OK, so, so Totems of September, where could people find this? Amazon? or It's on Amazon. We have a website called septembertotems.com. OK. And it's um, Barnes and Nobles has it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty readable, ready, available. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah, it's. For me, the best part of it is, um, although the stories are hard to listen to because there's one about a first responder and what happened to him, mm -hmm. uh, an Iraqi vet, um, two Afghani vets. So it's not just about Native people, but it's about how Native people and our traditions heal and can heal people around us too. It's mm -hmm. not just that, that we benefit from the healing. And that's really the whole purpose of the book is how do you heal through trauma and move forward. Wow. Well, I appreciate you coming all the way down from Washington. Well, thank you. It was an absolute it's pleasure been a to be pleasure here, and I love your crew. To have you here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank well, you. thank you for being here, and uh, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to uh, reading the book. I, you know, skimmed through it, but uh, now I have some time to read page for page and read about all those characters that your friends gave you. <laughs> See, if I had known you, I would have said, put us in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I've got the second one going <laughs> okay. on. Can, I can we want to be in the take names one. and put you in the second one. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll give names. But thanks for being thank here. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really it. appreciate it. And thank you for joining us uh, each week on Sundays watching Native Boys TV. We're also on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're, we have our website. You can tune in there and see what's going on. So we'll see you again next week. And thank you for joining us. Good night.